folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. I'm Anthony Skinner, the producer of the show. We're certainly happy to have you here with us today. And before we go any further, I want to introduce the host of our show, Ian Cron. Ian, welcome to the show. Anthony, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Good to see you today. Listen, we've got a great guest today. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the show and about uh, the guest himself? Yeah, so we're talking today with uh, Dr. Chuck DeGroat. Uh, Chuck is a psychologist. He teaches um, counseling and spiritual formation. Uh, he is a, a guy who has just written a terrific new book that's titled uh, When Narcissism Comes to Church. Healing Your Community from Emotional and Spiritual Abuse. And I'm excited about this conversation. And you know that this is a little bit of a thing with me. I, I bristle sometimes when people say, oh, so-and-so is such a narcissist, or, right. or I think he's a narcissistic personality disorder, or, you know, and they just throw the term narcissism around like it's confetti without really actually knowing what narcissism is. Right. They, they, they don't really have, at least from a clinical perspective, sometimes people will use the word narcissism when what they really meant is, oh, that guy's a little too self-interested or he's too into himself or she's, right. you know, too self-referencing all the time, blah, 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 blah. Well, narcissism is, is far more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens in the show that is so cool, he actually has a chapter in the book uh, titled The Nine Faces of Narcissism. Right. And he uses the Enneagram as a way to talk about how narcissism can show up in each of the nine types. Right. Yeah. It's and um, <clears throat> so people know right from the, from the get-go, right, when we talk about narcissism, we're, we're, we're talking about a continuum. Right. right? Yes. So, so you everybody all of us are on the the continuum of narcissism right some of us are very low some of us are very high we may not meet all the criteria for a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder but we're we're all kind of on that spectrum and probably moving around up on it from you know as as circumstances arise but we're going to talk today about n narcissism and uh, I hope it's only the first of two conversations. I hope the next time we have Chuck on, I want to talk about healing. And we are going to talk about the healing path for each of these nine types for their own particular um, manifestation or expression of, of narcissism, dealing with our own narcissism <laughs> by type. But I want to get him on to talk about how do we heal from having had a, a mom or a dad, or we have a, a partner or a friend, how, how do we deal and heal from narcissistic abuse? So I mean, we're, that's down the road, but this episode is killer because we're just gonna talk about what is narcissism? How does it show up in all nine types? And what's the healing path for all nine types to keep narcissism in check? Right. Right. And um, anyway, it's going to be fantastic. It's a great conversation. Yeah. It's applicable for all nine numbers. And um, it's, you know, his title includes narcissism in the church, but this is for everyone everywhere. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> this is not about, uh, you know, this isn't about just pastors and church leaders. We're yeah. talking specifically today about everybody. Yes. Uh, before we get to the show, we want to let everyone know if you're listening as you normally have been listening to the show, we are now also on YouTube. So you can continue to listen as you do with Apple and Spotify and whatever platform you have been listening on. But we would like to encourage you to pop over to Ian's YouTube channel, Ian Morgan Cron uh, YouTube, and check out the video portion side of what we're doing podcast wise. Now you can not only just here, but you can actually watch the interview as well as you are introduced to these guests. And uh, we want to encourage you to, su to subscribe to uh, the YouTube channel as well. So please do that. And then before we go on one other housekeeping thing, Ian, would you tell everyone about the special we have running on the IEQ-9? Yeah, so the IEQ-9 is my uh, my Enneagram assessment. Uh, we're, we're very proud of it. It's uh, it's really a great tool for uh, those people who are trying to determine their type. Uh, I think it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's the most accurate 
uh, test uh, available out there. And it gives such a robust report on your on your type, your subtype, et cetera, et cetera. And if people just go to Ian Morgan Cron slash assessment, they could put in the 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 uh, uh, passcode typology all in uppercase letters and get 20% off on the IEQ9. So I just want to strongly encourage people to do that. And just also one last thing, for those of you who listen to Typology regularly, um, if you would uh, do us the great favor of um, leaving a note of encouragement or kindness about the podcast, giving it five stars or you know just whatever mm -hmm. it is that you're supposed to do there, it really helps people find us. Uh, the more reviews we have, the, the more uh, opportunities people have to find the show, that would be terrifically helpful. Fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and get to our show and our guest, Chuck DeGroat. Dr. Chuck DeGroat, welcome to Typology. Thank you so much. We uh, have been really looking forward uh, to this, this conversation about the nine faces of narcissism, which is of actually tremendous interest to me. And I think it's gonna be tremendously interesting to our audience because, you know, everywhere you go, you hear people sprinkling the word narcissism into conversations like, uh, as if, I mean, this is a clinical term that they, they kind of just sort of throw around as if, you know, everybody who's self-interested or self talks about themselves too much, they label a narcissist. Can just take a moment before we jump into the nine faces of narcissism through the lens of the Enneagram, would you just maybe help us understand what narcissism actually is? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think we talk about it, we throw it around, uh, whether it's in you know, political figures or athletes or wh whatever it might be, Hollywood actors. Uh, and there is this caricature of narcissism usually of the grandiose, self-important person. And uh, what we get from the, uh, like the Bible of psychology, the DSM-5 is, is sort of like that. I mean, things like grandiosity, attention seeking, uh, a lack of empathy, which is, I think, highly significant when it comes to narcissism. Yes. And then they mm -hmm. talk about impairments in like vocation and relationships. And so there's, there's always a lot of disruption. Um, but, but, uh, I think it's more complicated than that. And that's why I have spent some time looking at these nine faces of narcissism uh, in and through the Enneagram. So how, first, first of all, how did you first learn about the Enneagram? I'm always yeah. that interested. Uh, we have a, my friend Kurt Thompson is coming on next, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, who is, you know, is a psychiatrist. And, and you know, so two, two of you, both of you, highly trained clinicians, um, I'm always interested uh, in how you came to learn about something which is essentially folk psychology in a way. Um, and uh, so what, what was your introduction to the Enneagram? Well, first of all, I love that you're having Kurt on. I mean, he's become a friend of the last few years and uh, what a beautiful human being and another four, by the way. So that's, that's nice. Let, let's just load up your podcast with fours. Uh, <laughs> that's right. You, you're a four. I'm a four. Anth Anthony's a four. Yes. I mean, a special podcast ever but <laughs> uh, yeah so uh we were just joking about this you know about accepting the, the the enneagram into my heart uh many many years ago actually when i was in seminary um i was this arrogant i was this arrogant seminarian who knew all this theology and you know had it all figured out until i got confronted by a professor who who said man you're going to be dangerous to the church if you keep this up and uh, so he challenged me to get some counseling, and actually I ended up doing uh, the mental health counseling program there in Orlando. This is back in the mid-90s. And I had a supervisor back then who was interested in, in the writings of Richard Rohr and uh, introduced me to the Enneagram through Richard Rohr. I, I read it, and you guys know how this goes. You start to see overlaps, right, in time. You start to see overlaps between, like, your clinical clients uh, and people who I was doing pastoral care for, and Enneagram types. Uh, and then I was, I was in the church planting world for a long time, where I've, I've seen, I've done tons of assessments over the year. I've probably done uh, 15 years worth of assessments of church planters and pastors. 
And that's when I really began to see how narcissism was showing up in all these different types. So it's just been a growing, for me, you know, just a growing uh, fascination, even before it got sexy in the last few years, just studying, studying the Enneagram and psychology. Right, which brings me to the name of your most recent book, which is When Narcissism Comes to Church, yeah. healing, healing Your Community from Emotional and Spiritual Abuse. And during this episode, we're going to talk more broadly uh, outside the church just about the nine faces of narcissism yeah. so that folks can kind of get a handle on it. And, um, but I'm, I'm excited about it because, you know, I meet so many people, including myself, who have experienced tremendous abuse and pain uh, from particularly people who have full-blown narcissistic personality disorder. I realized today we're going to be talking about people on a continuum. Is that, is that correct? I think that's really helpful. I mean, when I, the way I understand narcissism, and this is due in part to the work of a guy named Theodore Milan, a psychologist. I use a an assessment tool that he developed, and he puts us along the spectrum of type, style, and disorder. And so we might see narcissistic traits in, in me or you or anyone else. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, when we see it happening a bit more, when it becomes problematic in relationships, that might be narcissistic style. But, but there again, what I like to say is where there's curiosity, there's probably not a personality disorder. In other words, where where someone's willing to say, yeah, I can see how I impact you in that way, or I, yeah, I, I realize I showed up in that way at work and I hurt you or I bullied you, uh, that, that's when I say probably not a personality disorder. Uh, when we're disordered, that's when we often say as clinicians, it's really hard to see change or transformation at that point. It's, uh, the big word is characterological. This has been going on in, in your life for a long, long time, and that's where we just try to mitigate some of the damage. Right. Yeah. Usually when I uh, was um, early, early in my practice, I don't have a practice now, but early, early on out of grad school, basically, if I could spot a narcissist or a borderline in the first one or two sessions, which as you know, is very difficult. Yeah, right. Usually, it's usually about the eighth session that you realize, uh oh, I got a bad fish on my line. Yeah. And then you then, and then you're like, but it's too late to leave them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And usually I, I often say it's like the work, that one person is like the equivalent of three or four clients a week, you know. It's, uh, it's grueling work. It, it's exhausting work, as you know. Yes, it is. All right, let's jump into the nine faces of, of narcissism. And, yeah. and, and I'm just curious, what, what made you integrate this conversation about narcissism with the Enneagram. Yeah. So for folks familiar with the Enneagram, who've done any study, uh, there are, there's a couple of guys, Riso and Hudson, who did some work early on. And their work is really important. Uh, one of the most significant contributions they make to Enneagram studies is their levels of development. So these are like nine levels from, you might say, health to unhealth. And what I noticed uh, pretty early on is when you get down into that range of like seven, eight, nine of unhealth, you're getting into the territory of some pathology, uh, clinical pathology and personality disorders. Uh, for me, it, it, was, uh, it was a larger conversation really that, ha so there's that piece, right? There's that kind of Enneagram piece for me that was really significant. The second piece was I'm doing all these assessments of I'm doing church consulting, organizational consulting, pastoral leadership assessments. And like I'm seeing narcissism, and this is for your like listeners who are in the church, I'm seeing narcissism pop up, up on like a full 75% of my assessments, like on the spectrum. Wow. And um, but they're not all that grandiose type of narcissism, right? And, and a lot of people nowadays are more, uh, more equipped with Enneagram language. So they're telling me I'm a four, I'm a six. I'm a nine, and I'm like, wow, I'm seeing narcissism and nine. That I didn't think those two went together. Thus, the curiosity over like the last three to five years for me, I'm like, how, how do these two work together? Mm. So as we talk today and describe these nine types of narcissism, we're not, to be clear, talking about people with full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, per se. We're just talking about what does it look like when... Uh, each of these types 
uh, is manifesting um, a narcissistic style uh, yeah. or or type, and and then also what they can do to begin to grow out of the uh, the danger zone of of narcissism. I like that, I like that, and I and I think too. I mean, the conversation takes us away from. Oh God, he's an eight, so he's got to be a narcissist, right? Right, right. Or, he's a three. She always, of course, threes are narcissists, you know. And it takes us into maybe it takes us into the territory of more humility and curiosity, which I think, I mean, I, I think we're in good territory with the Enneagram when we're operating out of humility and curiosity with each of the types, right? So yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's important for everyone to realize that each of us is somewhere on that narcissistic spectrum. So it's not limited to a type. It makes an appearance in all nine types. Yeah, that's right. In all nine types, just in different ways, with different emphases. And so there, there again, we can, we can sort of look at ourselves and say, well, how does this show up for me? Uh, when it's so easy, I mean, I don't know if this is the case for you guys, but it's so easy for me to scapegoat and say, oh yeah, it's, I, can, I can see it in him, but not in me. So right. me as a four, how does it show up in a four, right? So, yeah. Right. Wow. Okay. Well, let's get at it. Okay. Let's, um, let's just sort of jump in. Uh, we're gonna, let's start in the heart triad, right? Yeah. Let's, let's start with twos, threes, and fours because, you know, um, we, we, we know uh, that this is a, a shame-based triad. And I noticed in your book, by the way, that the word shame and narcissism continually came up next to each other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shame is really a, a core feature of narcissism, right? And uh, you, you guys know when, when you work with folks like this, I'm sure you've seen it in your clinical work, Ian. I mean, when you get down to it, when you get to like the pay dirt level, when you get, you know, when you've got the, I mean, I've sat in an office of a mega church pastor and I've said, it just feels to me sometimes like you're about eight years old. You're just a little boy. And I've seen the tears start to come. Mm -hmm. I'm so scared. I'm so anxious. I don't know what people think. And I wonder what, and I, you know, that's the shame. That's the, that's the kind of core undergirding emotion. But we know for twos, threes, and fours that that's kind of, that's, that's the driver. That's the fuel uh, for us uh, in that particular triad. You know, it's so interesting you should say this because often when I talk with threes and particularly male threes, mm -hmm. Um, I often notice when I look into their eyes that they have this lost boy look. Yes. Uh, and, and it sort of is a, a, um, one of those somatic uh, or body triggers for me or indicators to me, ah, maybe I'm dealing with a three here because they have that kind of lost and forlorn kind yeah. of a look in the eyes. They could be smiling, they could be animated, but the eyes are giving them away a little bit. I don't know if that's your experience or not, but that's been mine. Oh man, that's so, uh, I love that. It, it feels so right. I've seen that look in the eyes of, of uh, high achieving three organizational leaders, mega church pastors, and, and you wonder why oh, they've got such influence. Uh, they, they gather so many people and, and yet they're so lost. Yes. Yes. Okay, so we're going to start in the heart triad. Let's, um, I'm going to leave it up to you to talk us through how narcissism makes an appearance in the lives of, of uh, every type. We're going to start with the two. Yeah, well, yeah, let's make this conversational because I'd, I'd love to, to hear uh, how you guys think about this. But I, I owe a lot for the two. I owe a lot to my friend and your friend, Michael Cusick. Oh, uh, gosh, yes. Yeah, Michael... Uh, Mike, well, you know, the two is sometimes called the, the savior, right? But Michael calls the two the benevolent narcissist. I don't, mm. I don't know if he's trying to be kind to himself or what. I mean, maybe we should bring him on and have a conversation. <laughs> but, but um, you know, the two, there's that kind of element to the two. You know, there, there's some Enneagram theorists that say there's a seductive or even manipulative quality to the two. That it's, it's kind of nice when we talk about helpfulness. You know, they like to be helpful. They have the need to be needed, right? But um, there is this kind of exaggerated need to be needed for the two. And narcissism shows up in this kind of, uh, sometimes for, for two in this kind of grandiose way, I, I need you to see what I'm doing. 
I need you to see that I'm coming through for you. And you guys know this, uh, the, the, the underbelly of the two sometimes is a kind of anger. They're connected to the eight, right? And there can be this kind of anger. Like, if you don't see me, I will make you pay. Mm. On the one hand, they look really generous and they look really gracious. But if you don't notice, uh, you, might, you might be on the receiving end of their fury. I wonder if that's been your experience at all with twos. Absolutely. Uh, and um, twos, you know, we often in a clinical sense, we might talk about them as being histrionic, right? Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of emotionality. There's a lot of this kind of bubbly, you know, over the top emotional uh, crying and laughing and, you know, uh, and, and seductiveness, which is a piece of that histrionic uh, um, thing. And I think that too is uh, a kind of narcissistic thing. You know, it's the, it's the look at me piece of the two. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, histrionic, uh, to be clear, that's a word that that's a close cousin of narcissism, right? Um, what we know from this DSM-5 is that there are, this, there are these clusters of personality disorders. And in cluster B, you've got histrionic and borderline and uh, antisocial and narcissist. And they all share features, you know? And so there's this overdramatic uh, type that we see in the two with constant emotionality, right? But Oh man, such an ache inside, right? Uh, and so when we talk about, I don't know if it's time for us to sort of talk about the healing path for each one as we go, but I, I know for twos, uh, they, they long to be seen apart from what they contribute, right? And so uh, I, I like to say with narcissism that I, with each type, I want them to invite me off stage, back behind the curtain, and I want to know what's, what's really going on with you. You know, I, I want you to see that there's something more to you than than your capacity to come through for others, for instance, mm -hmm. that we see in the two. Yeah, you know what's interesting? Here, here's a question I have for you. Imagine a two relaxes their personality, right? It just like the curtain comes down. Yeah. And I, and I ask this of people sometimes, and most of the time they don't know how to answer the question. And the question is, what emotion would you have to feel if you no longer could rely on your personality's strategy to get by. Wow. That's so what do you think it would be for twos? Wow. What emotion would you need to feel if you weren't relying on that strategy? And I might say delight, um, mm. delight in, in uh, who they are. Uh, apart from how they come through for you. That's, that's a first instinct of mine. What do you think? I, you know, I, I think that there's probably a, a positive and quote unquote negative, although it's not always a negative, right? I think, yes, delight, which is frightening, right? Because now you have to own your delightfulness. Yes. And that's a scary idea. Yeah. Uh, but I also think grief is in there. And I think, I think that's there for twos, threes, and fours. That yeah. grief is a very powerful underlying emotion for those three types. Yes, yes. Yeah, I remember years ago, uh, there was a man who was, felt he was absolutely essential. He was running AV for, um, in, a, in a church setting, actually, uh, two off the charts. And I remember uh, it was costing him time with his family and, and uh, real health with his family. And so I, I didn't fire him, but I said, hey, you, you got to step away for six months and just get tuned into your family. And I think what you're saying resonates a lot because there was this, just this sense for him of, like, who am I if I'm not the AV guy? Right. Who right. am I if I'm not helping? Yes. Uh, yeah. and, and, and having a setting in which I am recognized as the helper, or as you call it, the benevolent narcissist, right? Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah. So what's the healing path for that, too, again? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, uh, I think there's a wound, right? There are wounds um, that, we, that we could talk about. And I mean, the, the, we all probably in some way share, share all of these same wounds, right? We, we try to nail down particular wounds for each type, but I think they're shared in large part. But there is this deep longing to be, to be seen. I mean, I, when I think about twos, I think they were often parentified when they were young, meaning that mm -hmm. they, were, they were made to, to, to grow up too early, you know? And so um, sometimes for me, it, it's sort of like, you know, you get to be, you get to receive, you get to be in need. You don't have to help here. Um, you don't have to come through for me. You don't have to come through for the organization, for the church, for the team. You get, for this season, you get to just 
maybe grieve the loss, as you say, of, of, of uh, always having to be on and coming through for people and, and to just receive. And that's so hard, as you guys know, it's so hard for twos to just relax. Uh, in my clinical work, you know, it can take six months, a year for them to finally say, I came here today not thinking of a question that I could ask you, but <laughs> yeah. for you, you know? Right, right. Okay, so moving on to threes. Yeah. Okay, and you have different names for these types than I use. And so we call them the achiever, the performer. What do you call them? Achiever, performer, winner. Yeah, names are, I mean, names can be helpful at times, but achiever, performer, winner, person who loves to be on stage. When you ask folks, you know, when I'm, I've been doing some speaking on the book, I'll ask people, what are the classic Enneagram narcissistic types? And three will come up inevitably, like, first or second place, right? Because these are folks who uh, seem, seem to need to be on stage at some level. They need to win. They need some, some approval, right? There's probably some sort of wound around like, do, do you see me? Do you notice me? Do you see how good I'm doing? Um, do you see that I, you know, I, I, I started the play or I, I got the good grade or I, you know, I made the touchdown pass or whatever it might be. Um, What's really, what's really tragic when, when I think about threes is when that doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. And I remember w- working with a guy uh, who was probably closing in on 50 years old, who is like the star of the football team, who now, you know, now he's out of shape. He doesn't look that great. He's over drinking and he's just so sad. And again, it's sort of like with the two, who am I if I'm not the guy on the football field? Uh, he's pastoring a church. This is this is in a church context too, of of like seventy people, and for him it should be seven thousand, right? Because I'm only successful to the degree that lots of people are approving of me. Uh, sometimes with narcissism, we talk about a leader being a a mere hungry leader, mm. uh, a politician, um, uh, an influencer being mere hungry, and the crowd is the mirror, uh, and so you know. To, to the extent that you reflect back to me that I'm doing a good job, I'm okay. And without that, threes can feel pretty dang empty. Yes, they all have, twos, threes, and fours all have issues around identity. All three project images in order to mask what they fear is no identity behind the mask. Yeah, who, yeah, who am I? I mean, so when we talk about the healing path, the question becomes like, who am I then uh, if I'm not on stage? And, and uh, I, I remember years ago working with a guy who, uh, and I use this metaphor a lot of come, come backstage with me. You know, let's go behind the curtain, right? I use this a lot with threes in particular. And there was this sense of, of like, the, I, I don't know who I am apart from the lights, the camera, the applause, you know? Um, I think that there, uh, and I'd be interested, you know, you, you just raised that question for the two, but I do think that for twos, threes, and fours, there is a kind of grief when the strategy isn't working anymore, right? There's a, there's a deep and profound sense of loss. And, um, and there's, a, I think, maybe a befriending of solitude. You know, Henry Nouwen talks about the journey from loneliness to solitude. And they're so lonely when they, I mean, i I've worked in organizations where the narcissist has had to step away for a time. And it's sort of like, if I'm not in charge, if I'm not leading, then I, there's no identity anymore. And right. so I've got to sort of befriend myself. I've got to be okay with me. And man, that's, that's hard. That's really painful. Like when we set them up in like a retreat center for a week and it's like, I, I don't know what to do in the room all by right. myself. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to, I'm just bringing up something here uh, that was a, a quote about that I give to threes a lot that, um, uh, that comes from uh, Parker Palmer. Oh, good. And uh, uh, Palmer, Palmer writes, uh, our deepest calling is to grow into our own authentic selfhood, mm-hmm. whether or not it conforms to some image of who we ought to be. As we do so, we will not only find the joy that every human being seeks, we will also find our path of authentic service in the world. Yeah. And, and by the way, Parker is a self-identified three. Oh, wow. I didn't know that about him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and you know, in, in, in a culture that sort of elevates threes, do we, 
do we allow space? Do we create spaces for them to step away? And like when I was a pastor in San Francisco, uh, I would lead silent retreats, like 48 hour silent retreats. And my, my threes, my extroverted threes, after about 12 hours, they'd come to me for spiritual direction. They'd say, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. um, after 24 hours or 36 hours, they said, this saved my life. Wow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's because when the projection comes down, the green shoots of their authentic self start to come up out of the earth. And they go, wait a minute, there really is someone here behind the mask. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. Who is that? Yeah. A little boy growing up. Like, I like him. I want to yeah. spend with him. Yeah. I love the green shoots. Beautiful metaphor. So yeah. let's move on to the best number on the Enneagram, fours. Um, and uh, since we're all fours, let's, uh, I, I want to know, what does narcissism, how does it make its appearance in the life of a four, and what's the healing path? Oh, gosh. Well, we long to be special, right? Uh, it's, we're sometimes called the individualist, uh, the romantic, uh, the poet, depending on who you're talking to. Now, one, one quick distinction I'll make that we haven't talked about yet is there is often a distinction made among psychologists between grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. Interesting. Grand, grandiose being the kind of stage narcissism uh, and vulnerable narcissism being a kind of uh, offstage, more smug version of, I call it a smug superiority. Uh, it's like the shadow side of narcissism. Uh, he, here's, here's the distinction I make. The distinction between the pastor or the leader of an organization of 7,000 versus 70. And, and I, I was working with the Enneagram 4, uh, who is uh, the leader of the small church in rural Iowa. And I remember him saying, he even used the language of a 4. We are special. We're chosen. We're pure. We have the right theology. We have the right beliefs, you know, and this could be for an organ organization too. Like we, we, we create the right product. We're doing it the right way. Um, right in the sense of special, not in a one sense of right, but like we, we've got the most special, the most unique thing that we have to offer here that no one else has. And, and so for force, there really is this sense um, that you get sometimes for them of, of a kind of smug superiority, um, an emotional manipulation. You're either for me or against me. This is where we sometimes see the borderline personality manifest in, as a sort of narcissistic type. Um, a real sense of a question of, do you love me? Um, if, if you love me, you'll, you'll remain profoundly loyal to me and you'll show it. You'll recognize what a gift I am and how special I am. Um, so, so it's really, really painful. It can be really painful to be a narcissistic for, if you know what I mean. Yes, it's and it's. I I like what you said. Leave me because I think that uh, the feelings of deprivation, of actually desolation, would be yeah. a better word for yeah. sevens. It would be deprivation, but yeah. for but really for fours of desolation and abandonment. Yeah. Uh, these are children uh, in childhood. These are people who have. Uh, either had a real or perceived experience of profound abandonment, uh, either as literal or uh, emotional abandonment, and uh, thus the need to be special and unique to recapture the missing piece that led to the abandonment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and really working so hard for approval, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think one of the myths sometimes about fours uh, is that we're just so authentic. And I was just having a conversation with a guy this morning where, where I, I, I was talking to him about this, you know, and I, I said, I wonder if your authenticity is not just another mask, you know, and there's sometimes for you, a, a word that I use in the book, a vulnerability, not a vulnerability, but an F-A-U-X, a vulnerability. Oh, where, where like, I, he's so honest, you know, and sometimes when you're with him, he's like, oh man, I'm just... I'm struggling with such deep stuff, man. And it doesn't feel like you're connected. It doesn't feel like he's there. It feels like it's, a, it's an act of, of sorts, right? And so, so there, I, I mean, it, the, the healing path for a four um, can be murkier. You know, I mean, it feels so clear in some ways for a three because there's a stage self. You know, we talk about the false self and the true self. But sometimes it can be a bit deceptive for the four because they can come back to you. And I, I know I've done this with, well, I'm being honest. I'm being real with you. This is who I am. How come you can't accept who I am? Does that make sense? Right. Yes, it does. And, I, and 
one of the things that I've noticed about fours is that their addiction to, to suffering, whatever the event was, uh, the inciting event um, that they're addicted to, that they're always thinking about, my alcoholic father, uh, that terrible move we made from San Diego to Panama, you know, or whatever it is. Um, actually, there's, you have to, sometimes I've said this to a four and it's, it gets, I've gotten different results. But you say, can you tell me the real suffering that your reported suffering is actually hiding? Yeah. Wow. That's good. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, you know, they can get it. Usually they have to think about it a while because it's a, it's a fairly disequilibrating question. You yeah. Know? Right. I love, and, and I love your, the vulnerability. Yeah. Word. We, we, we use the word transparency and vulnerability and transparency is when you sort of project just the right image of where people think you're being vulnerable, but you're not actually being vulnerable to differentiate between the two. But I love that word. That's, that's great. And it works, right? I mean, and it's working more and more now. I mean, when I first got into uh, the work that I do, uh, there there was a sense that you can't really be honest about your stuff. You know, there's a stage self, and you don't really. But now people feel a whole lot more comfortable being like, "Man, I'm a, I'm broken." We use words like that. I'm so broken, man. I got so much crap in my life, you know. But it's not really, it's not really an on, honest kind of authenticity, if you want to call it that, right? Right. It, it's another. It's another way of distancing oneself uh, and protecting oneself. And so the, the healing journey, I mean, I, I think sometimes it takes a really adept and skillful therapist or spiritual director to really call that particular aspect of, of the four out and the unique version of narcissism, to call that unique version of narcissism out and invite them to, to the true self. Mm. And, and of course, we're all afraid that there's nothing underneath there, right? That we're completely empty, that if we get there, we're not going to find anything ultimately. Yeah, right. If I'm not special and unique, then I'm nobody. Nobody. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think that's incredibly helpful. So the healing path for the four then, as I understand it, for you would be, well, I'll, I'll just ask you the question. What is the healing path? I know you said it's yeah. murky, but as you try to explain it, what, yeah. what's your best explanation? Yeah, that's good. I, I sometimes use a metaphor, um, and the metaphor is the metaphor of a hurricane. You know, I, I was in Florida for 14 years. We had a lot of hurricanes come through, and you get caught up in the winds. And sometimes I'll even say, when, when people I'm working with get comfortable with this language, I'm, I'm, I'm getting tugged in again. I'm in the drama again. You know, I'm in the, will, will I approve of you or won't I approve of you? I'm, I'm getting the tug of war again. And I often, I often talk about it as an invitation to the quiet eye of the storm. You know, mm. every, every so often when a hurricane would come through, uh, we get to that eye where you see above to the clear blue sky and the winds would just stop. And folks who are willing to do the work are able to see how this strategy plays out for them to say, oh, right. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I want that quiet eye. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop, Chuck, and I'm, I'm just gonna show up now. So they kind of catch themselves in the act. Yeah, exactly. And if they can learn to disidentify who they are from the storm yeah, and, and, and live into their true self, I think that's an indication that they are on a, on a good path. Okay, let's move into the head triad, okay? Uh, how nar narcissism shows up uh, in the life of a, let's start with a five, okay? Yeah. The, we call them the investigators. What do you call them? Well, I call it the, the distancer, uh, the investigator, the distancer. That's a, that's a fine word. Um, now, when we talk about the head triad, uh, I, I think that we, I, I like to say that anxiety is at the core, right? And so it, shame is at the core of the, the heart triad, anxiety is at the core of the head triad. Um, and, and, and what I want to say, I want to honor our longing for security, but I also want to say that this is kind of an exaggerated disconnection from vulnerability that you see in the head triad, triad right? So there there's an incapacity to be really vulnerable. There's probably some wound around relationship where it was like, I'm going to go up in the, in the case of the five, the distancer, the investing, I'm going to go up to the fortress of my own head. And, and in so doing, I can keep a distance from, you know, the chaos in mom and dad's marriage, for instance, you know, I, I always love to, it's, it's funny. You guys probably have uh, done things like this. You, you use a particular metaphor story and, and fives, 
resonate with it. Mine is like they were the ones reading Tolkien in the closet of their bedroom by flashlight, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that was a safe place for them, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, so fives are intellectually distant and, and the narcissism can come out as a kind of condescension. Uh, I remember I was doing some work uh, in marriage counseling with a couple and she's looking at him like, just give me something. And he'd write down on, on uh, you know, a yellow pad uh, in ink. She just said, just give me something, <laughs> you know, right? Like she's begging it. She's right there. And I'm, I'm like, I have to call attention to the reality that like, where are you right now? Well, I just wrote it down. He says, you know, I just wrote it down. I'm just, I'm just recording the data. Well, you come out from the tower and look at her and show up for the relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, he, he sort of defends himself by saying, well, I'm, I'm paying attention, aren't I? You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do. Uh, just give me a chance to figure out what to do and I'll do it. You know, and so there can be, I think at worst, now th that's kind of a fun story, but I think at worst there can be kind of an arrogant condescension where they never come out of the tower. And in fact, they use their, their uh, extraordinarily brilliant minds to kind of drop mind bombs on people, you know, yes. bombs on people. And uh, in so doing, they, they really uh, destroy the, the opportunity for relationship and intimacy. Yes, I think uh, at their worst. I remember uh, I had a college professor who was a five. Okay. Uh, and I guess academia would, would attract its share of fives, right? Um, and I, I remember he was an English professor. I was an English major. And uh, he, he said, well, uh, um, he, he was talking to me about John Milton. And I said, gosh, I, I've, I've never read John Milton. And you could see him begin to look down his nose as if to pull down his glasses and go, you've never read Milton? Yeah. And, and of course, you could tell it was kind of a delicious experience for him, right? And I think that's an example of a five. Uh, they can be a little bit elitist, um, set apart by their own intelligence. But of course, that is a defense against deep-seated feelings of ineptitude and inadequacy. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Deep-seated feelings of ineptitude and inadequacy. Yeah, right. And I mean, it feels like uh, miles away to cross that chasm to the fore, to the heart, right? And, and I think when we talk about the healing path, there's a sense in which I, you know, I'll, I'll use the metaphor, I'll invite them out of the fortress, out of the tower, you know, come down from the tower and just give me a half hour in our counseling session, you know, give me a half hour, in, you know, right here in the flesh, and then you can go back up there. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I don't want I don't want them, I don't need them to take it too, too quickly. But I remember years ago, I was working with a guy where he said, okay, I'll take you up on that. Um, I'll play that game with you. He'd come down and um, he'd, you know, he'd spend a good half hour, 45 minutes with me and with his wife. And then he began to like it. He's like, wow, it's safer down here than I thought it was, you know? Um, I kind of like it in my heart. I'm starting to feel something in here. And yes. that's a really beautiful moment. But, uh, you know, that anxiety, that fear will send them right back up to the top of the tower uh, and, and scare them away. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like the healing path for fives is to just begin to take short forays yeah. in, into the heart, right? And, yeah. and be self-compassionate when you make a run. Yeah. back up to the mind but maybe next time it's an hour rather than half an hour yeah. or you know you just begin to almost uh you know it's like when you're trying to get an agoraphobic out of the house okay we're just going to go to the front doorstep mm -hmm. and then come back in the house and then we're gonna go out to the sidewalk come back into the house and maybe that's true of every type right I think we, so. we just take, make little trips yeah and i think you know just to kind of uh show show our cards for a second the work that we do sometimes i mean we, I think it's good to honor people's strategies at times. Like this, that's worked for them for a long time. And I, I remember when I was a new clinician, I just went in and on a like seek and destroy mission. Like that's, that's bad. That's sinful. That's hurting people. That's a bad strategy. And whatever I, you know, whatever language I used, you shouldn't live like that. That's no way to invite people to new life, um, new hope, um, presence all these good things right so yeah just step down for for a half hour 40 minutes with us and boy yeah to watch a five connect you know come online i like the language of coming online is a really beautiful thing 
Yeah. Oh man, that's great. Okay. Moving on to one of my favorite numbers, legitimately on the Enneagram, which is sixes, right? We call them the loyalists. You call them? The Hawkeye. (laughs) The hypervigilant one. Um, You know, I mean, I, when I think of, when I think of sixes, I'd be curious to get your perspective on this. Ian. I think of Jason Bourne. Uh, Mm. You know, some people would say Jason Bourne is an A. I I don't, by the way, I don't like to watch movies and like type all like Friends characters or Seinfeld characters and stuff. But, but I think of Jason Bourne as a six, like Jason Bourne just sees the room. He walks in, you know, and uh, he sees the exits. He knows what's going on. He sees the danger. He walks outside. Like he's memorized 17 license plates around him, you know? And so, I mean, sixes see everything. And I think unhealthy sixes, narcissistic sixes are so, so self-protective. And really that's kind of, that's what's going on underneath any kind of narcissistic persona, right? There's, there's an element of self-protection that um, they're, they're sort of like always identifying what, what could go wrong or what you're doing wrong. I remember working in an organization where this wasn't a leader of an organization. This was an accountant in the organization who was a six. And when you walked by her desk, inevitably you felt like you'd done something uh, like you just made a comment about her husband or her kids or something you felt like you'd done something wrong she'd look you look at you the hawkeye with the evil eye you know she sort of look at you out of the corner of her eye um inevitably as a four i'd feel like i did do something wrong and i probably <laughs> need to apologize right but um you know it was probably something like i i didn't i forgot to like report my mcdonald's receipt or something that week you know but but, you know, they're, they're rule keepers, rule followers and rule keepers. And, and uh, you feel when you're around them, you, you can sort of feel like you've done something wrong. Like you're always on your tiptoes, you know, tiptoeing around them. Like I, I, I don't want to get on their radar because they'll notice me and they'll recognize that I've, I've really screwed up this time. Mm-hmm. And so this might not be, see, this is not a grandiose narcissist necessarily. This might be another one of those more vulnerable narcissists that operate in the shadows, a little bit more behind the scenes. And yet, why am I tiptoeing around her? How come she, or how come he has so much power in my life? Hmm. You know, it's interesting uh, in the world of uh, intelligence, right? In the intelligence services, uh, Mm -hmm. they talk about um, training for situational awareness. Yeah. And uh, situational awareness is like when you walk into a restaurant, the first thing you do is you, you if, especially if, let's say if you're a bodyguard, you're a secret serviceman, you walk in, you know where the exits are, you look at every single person in the restaurant and you do an assessment. You, uh, you, you know, uh, what am I going to do if someone comes from the right or from the left? Um, they can tell, I mean, you know, they're so deeply trained, and which is a, almost a six is self-trained in situational yeah. awareness. And I think Again, I want to remind people what we're describing here is is not a a six in their normal operating pattern in let's say the average to healthy space. Th- this is how what what we're, when we're talking about sixes who are at the very least in the in the style of the narcissist, right? A little higher on the spectrum than normal. That we're all the types we're talking about. Is that is that true? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I remember you know sixes we know are very dutiful, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I remember I was, I was meeting regularly with a guy. He loved, he showed up on time. He was a cop, maybe, you know, he showed up on time. Um, and when uh, he knew that when we had our times together at the 50 minute mark, we were done. And, uh, you know, so it was like 49, 49 minutes, 30 seconds. He'd be like, okay, okay, well, I got to get going. You got to get going. And, and here again, uh, you know, there, with five, sixes, and sevens, there's this basic anxiety. And they are kind of disconnecting from vulnerability. And, um, you know, I remember saying to this guy, what, what if we broke the rules? Like, what if you stayed five minutes longer? And he's like, well, really? Could we do that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you call these folks the hypervigilant narcissist, yeah. right? Uh, and I think that, that really captures a lot of what, what it is that you're saying. Yeah. And so the healing path would be what? Yeah, right. So that's it. I think I just, I just sort of hinted at it with this guy to say, Hey, what if there's life? What if there's life beyond your hyper anxiety, your hyper vigilance, the rules? Like, what if, what if you and I could be present to one another in a way um, that didn't require us to have to worry so much? You know, like, and I, I, I think that it, it's sort of you have to notice the strategy of rule keeping, and you have to sort of undermine it for them. You know, and so this is where it's we. It depends on the person, right? So I'm talking very generally right now, but for like for this guy. 
it was such an honor for him to, to stay for that extra five or seven minutes. Like he's breaking the rules for me because all I've known since I was a little boy is if I don't keep the rules, there's chaos in my home. Mm. And so Chuck's inviting me out. You know, uh, Ruby uh, has this quote. I'm not going to be able to quote it exactly, but come out to the field beyond right doing and wrong doing, right? Yes. Like, come into the field and I'll meet you there. And guess what? We might actually be able to experience some sense of delight or wonder with one another. Mm. And so I, I want to find that field beyond right doing or wrong doing for the six. Mm. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to sevens. Yeah. I know we've probably got to speed it up, right? So seven, seven, um, you might call the optimist. I mean, what, leaders of sevens. Okay. Well, so Naranjo, Claudia Naranjo, the great psychologist, Enneagram psychologist, um, called the seven, uh, the, the archetype of narcissism. Yes. Right? And, and I think this is because the seven is always ahead of everyone else, right? The seven, the optimist, the visionary is always kind of um, 17 steps ahead of everyone else in the organization, right? I've got a vision. I've, didn't you just have a vision last week? No, but I have a new vision. Uh, if anxiety is operating for the fives and sixes and sevens, they're operating out of anxiety too, but you might not see it because they've got very compelling personalities, right? Uh, you want to follow them. They're inspiring. Like, oh yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to go there. I'd love to try that. I'd love to eat that food. I'd love to, but I remember I learned a lot about sevens when I was in the Bay Area. Um, I had a good friend who was a seven. Whenever we got together, it was like there, there was always the anticipation of the event more than the event. You know, when we get together next time, we're going to have filet. I'm going to bring this incredible wine from Napa. And, we, and then we get there and it was sort of like, oh, but next time when we get together, we're going to have uh, halibut and then we're going to have this other wine paired with it. And I think with fives, sixes, and sevens, it's about inviting each and every one of them into vulnerability, into liminality, right? And I think for a seven, um, they're, they're so fearful of limitation. Uh, I, I think this is where I, I like the liturgy, right? I love Ash Wednesday, and I, I think Lent can be a great gift to sevens. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Yes. Return to the yeah. ground of your own being, because you're always like, you're always kind of hovering 5, 10, 50 feet above the ground. Yes, Richard Rohr likes to say that sevens want to believe that we live in a world uh, where there's no Good Friday and it's Easter all the time. Oh, yes. Wow. That's so good. That's so right, right? And so I think the healing path for sevens is an introduction to liminality, um, to uh, futility, uh, to the present moment, to the, you know, to the uncertainty of the present moment. Like they, they're in their head for a reason. Their future scheming for a reason, right? Mm. So um, I remember when I go and I meet my buddy out at a fancy restaurant. Usually he's the one who paid in the Bay Area, so that was nice. But um, um, I'd say, what would it look like for us to not be planning for the next time together, but to enjoy the right here and the right now? Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember at what it took for him was it took some grief to go back. And maybe grief is significant for all these, Ian. But um, yes. It took losing his mother and sister within the span of about six weeks, and then the tears started to come. Mm -hmm. And there was no, there was no capacity to like plan um, away from the the immediate feelings of uh, extraordinary grief and pain. Yes, yes, I have seen that personally as well, and it's a it's a hard moment for sevens when when that happens, and you it's almost like having a puppy on a leash. You have to say stay, yeah. stay. Don't, don't, don't make a joke out of what you're doing out of your tears. Don't, don't stay, just stay with it. You know, I, I think for sevens too, where, where sometimes narcissism shows up is um, it's a, the lack of empathy um, for what they're, because they hate limitations. Yeah. Wow. They may say, uh, well, I'm going to go do this. And then another person says, well, that's going to be really inconvenient for me, or that's something I'm not comfortable with. And the seven may say, yeah, I really don't care because it's something I want to do. It's, it's, it's right. my next fun thing. And it's like, there's the lack of empathy, yeah. you know, uh, that you see come through in the seven. Yeah. And I, you know, I've seen it in organizations where, you know, seven is leading the charge. Uh, we're going to do this and this, and I've got a new vision for and, and And the six is saying, I just, I just got the rules down for the last vision. Like I just figured out what, what we had to do. And, you know, and so it can be exhausting, really, really exhausting, mm -hmm. particularly if they don't have empathy for others who are saying like, I'm just not there with you yet. I'm still trying to get my head around the last thing. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, you mentioned the healing path already. Let's, let's go on to the gut triad. Let's, let's head into eights. Okay. So, you know, with gut types, I think if we've got shame at the core of twos, threes, and fours, and anxieties for fives, sixes, and sevens, anger might just be at the core of eights, nines, and ones. And I think there's a really beautiful longing for justice and righteousness, but I, but I often say that for these folks, there's a kind of addiction to conviction. And uh, the gut is so certain, right? And I just know that this is the right thing, Chuck. And uh, so help me, God, I'm going to go in this direction. And I've got to put that on Facebook. I just have to, because it's in my gut, you know? And so when we talk about eights, well, eights, eights are usually up there, number one, two, or three on the list of what, when I ask people, what do you think the narcissistic type is on the Enneagram? Because eights can come off as, as bullies. Um, I call the eight the challenger. And there can be kind of this command and control style for eights. Uh, oftentimes when I've worked with eights, there's some experience of feeling small, insignificant when they were young, small, insignificant, maybe bullied. And there was uh, maybe a moment or a sequence of moments where they decided consciously, unconsciously, that I will never be in the one down position again. Um, I will be in control. And so They'll, they'll move into a room with great certainty about, uh, certainty about what we should do or what we should become or what the purpose of the organization is, and, and at, at times, very little empathy. And I, I think one of the things with the, uh, the eights, if we put them in that, what the DSM-5 calls the cluster B personality disorders, narcissism, histrionic, borderline, sociopath, there, there are times when eights can become dangerous, where they don't know their own power. Yeah. Um, and they can become verbally abusive, maybe even physically abusive uh, out of that kind of narcissistic. And they don't even know they're doing it. Like I just thought, I remember an eight said, when I said to an eight, I reflected back to him. I said, it seems like you're angry right now. And he said to me, I'm not angry. I'm passionate. Like doesn't even know his strength. Mm, and, so, right. uh, and so I think the healing path is, again, to get behind that curtain and to, to recognize that underneath there's that little boy, that little girl who's really just kind of scared, really just wants to be loved and is tired of, of um, exerting force into the world all the time. I mean, it can just be exhausting. Does that resonate yeah. with your experience? It, yes. And I, I've seen, again, we're talking about types that are probably higher on the narcissistic spectrum right. than people in sort of in that average space. Uh, but we work with them, we live with them, and so it's good to know what it's like and how we can lower the curtain on them and try and get behind what's going on. I think part of the healing path for eights is learning how to be open-hearted without cynicism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that there's an element of cynicism about the world that eights have. You know, like the world is a mean place where, you know, it's hostile and if you don't take control, someone's going to take control of you. Yeah. And so if you can teach them, how, how can you be open-hearted without that cynicism yeah. about the world? That, that's, a, that's a healing path. Not an easy one, but it is a path nonetheless, you know. Ooh, I love that. Um, all right, nines. I'm married, I'm married to a nine, and oh. uh, I've, I've got a nine daughter. Tell me, tell me what's going yeah. on there. So I'm married to a nine, too. What about you, Anthony? <laughs> I'm married to a four. <laughs> okay. Two fours. <laughs> I assume you're married either, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, I mean, in some ways you've never known quiet rage until you've experienced it with a nine, with an unhealthy nine, right? And so, I mean, we're talking about narcissistic types of each one of them. Uh, nines can make you pay, not in a kind of eight direct way or a one self-righteous kind of way, but in a kind of passive and subtle way. Again, this is that vulnerable narcissism that we were talking about earlier. And one, I forget who it was, one Enneagram writer I read at one point, maybe it was you, Ian, who talks about storing up arrows in the quiver. It's sort of like you, you know, you've got, you've got, a, you've got a full armory behind you, you know, and you're just waiting for the arrow to come out. But I, I like to say that the arrows don't come out directly with the nine, they come out sideways. Um, it was like, what, what was that? You know, it doesn't hit you between the eyes like a two by four. It's like, what was that? It just hit me in the tailbone. You know, it hit me in the side. Um, not, nines will never come at you directly or rarely come at you directly, but they will 
there's a force to them. And you guys have probably experienced some element of this where it's like, I, I will, I will exert my force by disappearing or becoming silent or not responding to your phone calls. And, and that's how I'll maintain power in the relationship. And so there is that kind of narcissistic power, manipulation, lack of empathy that, uh, that we see in nines that uh, may, may not be as obvious. Like when we're talking about the nine faces, like the nine is the last when people talk about narcissism. Um, but the healing path really is like, nines are lost right at some level like nines nines really struggle to figure out who they are um and they're constantly sort of borrowing emotions of others and um and i and i think the the anger too the passive aggressive anger is something that just sort of comes out sideways but i i do think that there's a sense in which rather than pushing back against it i i want to say you're you're asking me to notice you like I, I remember a nine client of mine in my counseling practice didn't show up for a session or two and uh, she was pissed off at me. <laughs> and um, instead of charging her for sessions or instead of saying, well, what was that about? You know, I, I was like, oh, I think you're trying to get my attention. And, um, and we, we began to discover the strategy. And so doing, she, she was able to, to have a voice with me. I created a space for her to begin to have a voice to say, okay, so I, instead of making you pay by missing sessions, I'll tell you, I really am angry at you, Chuck. It, it, it feels like last time we were together, fill in the blank, you know, you didn't show up or you weren't th there for me. So um, nines are really fun to work with, um, but, but sometimes tricky and subtle when it comes to narcissism. Makes sense? It really does. Uh, we like to say when an eight is married to a nine that it's uh, uh, an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and, and that really, I think, describes a little bit of that nine stubbornness that kind of comes out, you know. So you may get a nine in therapy and you, you, in marriage therapy, and you've got the four talking in a million miles an hour about what they're feeling, and the nine just cries. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you just have to say to the nine, I appreciate your tears, mm. but let's get behind what, the, but I also recognize that this is a defense against saying, what you're really feeling right now. Yeah. Uh, and it's also your way of making the, the four or the two or whoever the other client is look bad for being a mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, book. I mean, I think, go ahead, Anthony. I was going to say, I love the quote in your book from the Desert Father talking about the nine where they seem to be silent, but they're really talking all the time. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. That is so good. So the healing path for the nine, I think you just described with your client, right? Which is, uh, that they, they need a space in which they can be called out of their passive aggressiveness and saying, I wonder if that passive aggressive behavior is really just your way of asking me to notice you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are you, what are you really trying to say? Cause you're saying it in a thousand different ways other than the way I really need you to say it directly right to me, share right. with, with me what's right. going on. Yeah. And what's so beautiful, you know, in my in my own marriage, we've had a lot of healing around this. My wife has done a lot of work, and it, it has been so beautiful to watch. And um, you know, when a nine actually does get angry at you directly, all of a sudden you go, oh, "There you are." Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's oh, it. There you are, and I love it. Yes. Bring it. Keep that coming. Keep that coming because you've now moved from this blurry kind of atmospheric presence to a defined, individuated human being. Yeah, yeah. And it's I, very powerful. I don't know if your wife does this, but Sarah, my wife, she'll, it, it's almost like she perks up and she gets kind of up on her seat and, okay, here we go. Now I'm gonna bring it all. I, like, I'm gonna get it out. I'll get more in an hour than I will in the next three weeks, right? But um, right. like, here we go. I, and I love that, that's beautiful. And that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's uh, all nines on a healthy journey uh, end up in a place like that where they, they yeah. really, more honestly yeah we have we we have a joke around here when annie gets mad at me directly she'll she'll get angry and i'll, I'll honor what she's saying and listen to it but eventually at the end of it i'll go you know that's very sexy right <laughs> 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 okay moving on to our last one let's talk about one the the narcissistic uh, expression in ones oh everyone's been waiting for this one right the the perfectionist right the um so when, when I think about the one, I mean, uh, sometimes it's helpful. We, we're not even getting into subtypes here in this conversation, right? But, you know, the, with the social one, there's a, this air of uh, moral superiority. Uh, with the one-to-one one or the sexual one, 
there's more of a direct kind of um, co confrontational anger that you see. I mean, of course, there's anger behind the eights, nines, and ones, but the ones are, um, there's a narcissism that manifests in perfecting you and perfecting others. There's a kind of moral superiority and righteousness. When you're around them, you just don't feel like you measure up. You know, like when I'm a, I'm a four around ones, I just, I, I, I feel like I miss the instruction manual. Um, I, I'm, you know, they, they know, you know, I'm on a faculty now, which is, by the way, kind of silly, but I sit around a faculty table with people with degrees from Harvard and Yale and Duke and all these places. And I often don't feel like I measure up. But like the ones around the table, there are lots of ones and fives. Like the ones, they know the polity. They know the rules. They know the handbook, you know? And I'm always like, oh, God, I don't know. The, I don't, what, what was I supposed to do? You know? <laughs> but, but they'll bring it up um, in, a way, in a way where I'll sometimes feel like I'm walking on eggshells around them right? It's like all you know is the handbook. All you know are the rules. And um, come out and show me who you really are. I remember back in the day when I was a Presbyterian, I was introducing, um, uh, I was introducing a candidate in a, uh, in a large group assembly. And I said something like, this is a good man. This is a really good man. I like him a lot. And, uh, and a guy stood up, and this is like Presbyterian language, but he was like, point of order. Can we call anyone good, uh, Reverend DeGroat? Can we call anyone good? I was like, what is going on here? Um, right. to make a point of order to, to you know, to, to correct my, uh, you know, my state. So, I mean, I, I think that I, I love ones because I think ones have a deep sense of justice and righteousness. They, they long um, for the world to be put to rights, right? They, they see things that the rest of us um, need to see. But ones also need to know their impact, you know, and I, and I think that uh, part of the work that I've done over the years with ones is to reflect back their impact. Like on, on the one hand, I love, I love, love, love your longing for, for, um, for righteousness and for justice, um, for a world that is, um, is good and right and pure and just, um, at the same time, uh, sometimes it just feels like, um, you're pushing me away with that, you know, like I'm not invited into the conversation. Um, like, like maybe, maybe it's more messy than you think, you know, and maybe let's, maybe we can get good and honest about the messiness, um, not only in the world, but in you as well, the brokenness mm. as well, you know, and uh, of course, one's learned from a very early age um, to, to do it right, uh, to, as so as to avoid the messiness in their own lives, in their own hearts, right? So to, to walk down the road with them and to be led into that messiness is a real honor and a real privilege. Yeah. Well, all right, so we've walked through all these numbers. We've talked about how narcissism shows its face in yeah. each of these nine types. Um, chances are, depending on our level of health, uh, we can float around from extreme uh, narcissism to low levels of narcissism in any given day. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And we just, we have to, but, but knowing those healing paths, how do we, how do we move away from narcissism as it presents itself in our in our particular type is really really helpful. So I have just a few more questions, and we got to split. Yeah. Um, so one is, do you think you know we hear this language about childhood wound, and you know reason you use it. So here's the childhood wound that led to the creation of this personality style or this personality yeah. type or this personality type. And I wonder if we could actually call it a narcissistic wound. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that's, is that a fair thing to say or am I? Yeah, I think it's fair. And I think it gets back to, I mean, I, I think what's behind that is um, the, the deep need each and every one of us have for security, um, for soothing, to be seen, you know, to be held, to be known, to be special, right? I mean, the fours don't just need to be special. We all long to be special in mom's eyes and in dad's eyes. And, you know, and, and, um, and, and that's, we, we know from uh, good attachment psychology that, right, in those first minutes, hours, days of a child's life, we just long to be seen, be looked at, to be mirrored, right? And so yep. my daughter, when she was five and she was doing cartwheels, and she was saying, Daddy, 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 look at me. Look at how good I'm doing a cartwheel. Well, listen, that's like good, healthy confidence, esteem, narcissism. Like, you can do it, girl. I love you. 
Um, what I like to say, though, is like if you're the leader of an organization and, and you're 45 or 55 now and you're still saying, look at me, look at me, I'm so great, that's a problem, right? Yeah. Now you're trying to get those wounds healed in a way that is profoundly unhealthy. And, and so there's lots of work to be done uh, in, in, the, in the story of one who is trying to heal those wounds through narcissism at 55 uh, that were inflicted when he was five. Yeah, and I think that's a great place to end. And, and I think it's a great place to end because I think all of the types, right, are engaging strategies uh, that to get needs met that uh, because of some kind of a disturbance or disruption in that process of mirroring. Yeah. Of not being seen. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, mirroring uh, is this gaze between the mother and the child, if you will, let's put it in that language, yeah. um, where the child and the mother, the, the, the child recognizes the mother uh, eventually as other, but, the, but the, the, it is seeing and its own existence is being validated by the mother. Yes. And, and its, own, its beauty is yeah. being validated by the mother. And of course, as you know, pretty much every time you meet somebody with a personality disorder, it's because there has been a profound disruption in that mirroring at some point. Some, some developmental damage has taken place. Um, well, this has been an amazing con conversation. And uh, the next time you're on, and I bet you I'm going to get a ton of email about this, mm. what I want to talk to you about is what is it like if you grow up with a, nar a truly narcissistic, narcissistic, full-blown personality disordered mother, father, if you have a brother or a sister, a partner um, who is a narcissist, What's the journey to healing and freedom like for those folks? Because I just hear from them all the time. Yeah. Well, let's do it again sometime. I loved it. That would, that would be so great. Thanks again, everybody. I want you to remember to go out and get your hands on uh, Chuck's uh, new book, which is When Narcissism Comes uh, to Church, Healing Your Community from Emotional and Spiritual Abuse. Thanks for being with us, Chuck. And please, everybody, remember the words of the great Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Until next time.